Welcome everybody. Uh, this is Alex Antonio here. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Fins Attached Marine Research and Conservation. Uh, we were founded in 2010 uh, with the goal of conducting research, promoting conservation, providing education, and have an advocacy agenda for the protection of sharks around the world. So we're really excited uh, with our speaker here today, uh, Dr. Peter Klimley, formerly retired uh, professor from UC Davis, who's the director of the Biotelemetry Lab at UC Davis. Uh, Dr. Klimley has, uh, was given the nickname of uh, Dr. Hammerhead uh, from early in his career, because that was the main species that he was studying uh, when he was working uh, on his uh, thesis work in Mexico. So we're really excited to have Dr. Klimley, aka Dr. Hammerhead, who really is a pioneer when it comes to shark research. Back in the uh, early 70s, uh, when shark research wasn't really very prominent, uh, Dr. Klimley was in the forefront developing methodologies, techniques, building tags. He was an electronics guy, as well as a free diver, a tagger, shark researcher. So we're privileged to have uh, Dr. Klimley with us uh, here today. And also, I just want to let you know, this is his latest book, Dr. Hammerhead Swims with Sharks, uh, which is actually a fins attached publication. And so um, maybe after this talk, if you like what you hear, it might motivate you to get a copy of the book. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn control over to the meeting to Dr. Klimley, who's going to educate us about uh, scalloped hammerhead sharks and how they use sea mounts and move around the ocean depths. Over to you. So, so Alex, I'm going to start uh, a little bit in an auto, autobiographical way. Um, in when I was very young, I was interested, uh, keenly interested in animal behavior. I kept many fish tanks and would observe how different species uh, mated. Uh, the Siamese fighting fish, it makes a bubble nest and puts the females' eggs in it. Fascinating stuff. And I, by the early 70s, I, I became interested in sharks, keenly interested in sharks. I had gone down to the Florida Keys with my wife and, and, and actually seen a shark underwater. And um, and so I wanted, and I had read an article in National Geographic about uh, uh, Diane Fossey had left the cage. She actually left the cage and approached uh, gorillas and, and, and imitated submissive behaviors. You could learn about them. And so I wanted to learn about sharks, and at that time, sharks were all considered dangerous. Man-eaters, that's a terribly sexist term, but that's what they thought them, thought they were. And the even the Navy funded uh, scientific research to find out uh, why sharks attacked, because the Indianapolis had sunk and many sailors had been attacked at that time. And so I... Uh, entered the Rosensteel School of Marine Atmospheric Science uh, to get my master's degree. And I worked with Arthur Merberg, and he was the prize student of Conrad Lorenz, a genius who had pioneered the field of ethology, that is getting in the environment and understanding the behavior of animals. So I was in the right place. And I, and, and we studied uh, sound reception in sharks. There are certain sounds that were emitted by the prey that attracted sharks. Uh, and we studied that, you know, what frequency and pulse intervals and so forth. But then at the same time, there were sounds boom, 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 that frightened sharks. And that I studied too, in, in particular for my thesis. And um, and, and, and this is common in, in the animal kingdom where there are approach behaviors and withdrawal behaviors. So I left Miami, I went to California like so many people do, and, and entered Scripps Institution of Oceanography. 
and I worked with Donald Nelson. I got, again, through an Office of Naval Research grant, I was funded uh, to work with Donald Nelson, who did get in the water with shark, but he got in the water with a, a power head. You know, he would blow him away if they got too close. And and I, so the first thing I did when I went to Scripps is I, I, I got, I acquired a boat, had it built for me, and I built a, a platform which had a, a cage over the front of it. And that fit in the bow of the boat, had flotation. I'd go out, oh, five kilometers from Scripps, put it in the water, We'd start baiting, and uh, and there I would lie looking at uh, where where uh, the bait canister was, and observing the blue sharks that arrived one, two, three, four, twenty of them in a feeding frenzy. I thought to myself, what am I going to learn when? I mean, how much can you learn if you're observing people at a, eating dinner? I needed uh, to get a, a more representative. A situation where I could really study what sharks were doing. So I went up to the Southwest Fishery Center where they had a telescope. Now that telescope they used to view uh, Black's Beach, which was a nudist beach. Well, anyway, they had noticed that um, sharks, uh, leopard sharks, arrived in large schools in the spring on May 15th. And sure enough, May 15th, they were there and observing them. But then I couldn't get close enough to them to really find out what they were doing. So I was really frustrated at this point. And uh, one of my trips to Long Beach to, to talk with Don, I said, I, I, how do I get close enough to sharks to really understand what they're doing? And so he he looked at his desk and he, opened up a drawer and he pulled out a slip of paper. It was had a typewritten one side of the paper. It was from Earl Harold, the ex uh, director of the Steinhardt Aquarium. And on it, it said, I have seen these schools of hammerhead sharks at a distance while diving at Las Animas. Now Las Animas is a very remote rock in the Gulf of California. And Don looked me in the eye and he said, you know, if you really want to study sharks, you got to get in the wa water with these hammerhead sharks. But remember, they're the third most dangerous of all sharks. Well, so I spent that next year going to places. I went to southwest Mexico, uh, an island off of Huaymas, uh, looking for them to uh, Loreto, halfway down the Gulf of California. Finally, uh, I rendezvoused with Don and uh, Ted Rulison, who was a surgeon, a surgeon, a retired surgeon, who had been diving in, in the Gulf for many years and had seen these schools of sharks at different locations, among them being Las Animas. So we uh, drove our panga, there's a Mexican boat, out to Soravo, which is an island uh, west of uh, La Paz, we jumped in the water. Boy, there they were. Hammerhead sharks, the school of hammerheads. So Don and I quickly got our masks on, our scuba gear, and we started, got in the water. We started swimming in their direction. They weren't there. So, oh, how frustrating. We got back in the boat and we drove back to La Paz. We got a lot of uh, frozen fish. Uh, and we we also, got a sound system, a little, an amplifier and a speaker that could play these low frequency sounds. Came back the next morning, I get the scuba gear on and I, I dive down and he drops the, the, uh, the speaker down a hundred feet. I'm down, I'm down there a hundred feet by, my, by myself uh, looking and it starts playing these sounds. And I'm kind of a little nervous waiting for these sharks to appear, but they didn't appear. So I came to the surface and I'm get out of the water, sit down next to Don. We're looking at each other. And Ted Rulison tells us, well, you know, I got to go to the bathroom. So he jumps in the water and he swims about 10 meters from the boat, you know, grabs his knees, looking down. And he says, oh, here they are. 
And Don and I looked at each other at that moment, and we realized what was happening, and that is that the bubbles from scuba were making these low frequency sounds and sudden sounds. So that was frightening the sharks. And furthermore, the, the bubbles as they get, they, they come to the surface, they go back and forth, they get bigger, 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 made low frequency sounds, but also they reflect light. So we put on our snorkel and our masks and we swam towards these hammerheads. And Let's see here, we can move. And, and there, underneath us, we could just vaguely see them, the shapes of these sharks moving slowly. And uh, we looked at each other and I guess I was a graduate student and this was gonna be my doctoral uh, study. So I took a big breath and I dove down and, uh, and This is what I saw. I, I could touch the sharks as I went down. And either so that's how close I was. And I, then once I got down, I got I dove really deep, of course. And and I'm looking up, and I could see the silhouette of these beautiful sharks against the surface. And ah, oh, so beautiful. And 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 then I, uh, I I came back to the surface and and popped up out of the water, breathing frantically, and. The first thing that came to my mind is the question of why do they form these schools? Now, most schooling fishes are smaller. They form these schools to avoid predation by hammerheads and other sharks. But these hammerheads are big. What would be feeding upon them? So why do they form schools? And so this became the topic of my doctoral dissertation. And uh, of course, when you want to find out why they form schools, you got to get an explanation. Just think sex. <laughs> we always do. Think sex. Is it? Uh, are they uh, to breed? And and um, so you need to know the size of them. Are they all mature? Now, to do that, uh, in the beginning, uh, as you see here on the left, I use Don as a reference, but that was just estimating the size. So I, I went and I took the pole that Don's carrying right there, and I, I painted it black and white and black and white and in and, and 20 centimeter increments and dove down and put it next to the shark's uh, uh, dorsum, uh, its, its snout, but the shark moved. So I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't use that to measure the, the shark's uh, length. So being at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, people there are studying animals in the deep sea. They use a submersible called the, we're using a submersible, call it the Alvin. But if you're down a thousand kilometers, you can't get out of the, uh, the submersible and put a tape measure to a deep sea fish. What, you, what they used at the time was a technique called stereo photography. And on the right here is a stereo camera that I built out of two Nikonis uh, cameras. And I separated them 50 centimeters. And then I would take simultaneously take a, a photograph of the shark. And the separation between the shark's snout and the two photographs was equivalent to 50 centimeters. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if one of you want to decouple your uh, your microphone, but maybe you can tell me how large this shark was. This is the largest shark I ever measured. So who's going to try it? Robin, are you going to try it? Ah, uh, come on. So so anyway, if you look at it, so you see. Right here, this is. Ah, I have somebody. So, t how how large is that shark? Um, I would say that's about seventeen feet. Okay, okay, seventeen, but in in meters, let's say. So you got fifty centimeters right there. The separation there, 
So how many of those 50 centimeters can you fit in the length of the shark? That's about four to five meters. Well, it's 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 actually if you take it, okay, one one. Okay, here we go. Look at the cursor because that's one, that's mm -hmm. two. So that's a meter right there. That's a meter and a half. That's two meters. That's two and a half. That's three. This was a monster of a female, three and a half meters long. So that's good. You're you're getting this technique. So there's Hank Niehaus taking a photograph of a shark, measuring its size. Right here, we have a histogram. And a histogram on the bottom axis, the ordinate, are the lengths. On the uh, abscissa is the frequency. I, and I hope some of you will follow this. I, being a scientist, I operate with graphs and visual things. I like to, I don't like to tell anybody anything. I want to show them uh, what I'm, I'm arguing. So if you look at this and you look at the stippling right there, and you look, these are the females with the, the uh, X underneath, you see that the <clears throat> there are a lot more females than males, which is the dark. Uh, some of them, you, it's difficult to see. You got to get underneath the shark because they have glass claspers. Their, their pelvic fins are scrolled and the male has a scroll and that's a clasper. It's used in, 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 in reproduction. Um, the female doesn't have it. <clears throat> well, you'll notice some of these females are pretty small and they're not mature because we determined maturity was at 218 centimeters, you know, six feet or larger. So uh, we also noticed uh, that uh, they, certain individuals, the larger individuals were towards the center of the graph. Now you could use that stereo camera to set up a Cartesian coordinate system where you could actually position the sharks in it. And you could therefore tell how far into the school they are. And again, we have a graph for you, but in this case, it's distance into the group, which is on the uh, ordinate and then uh, uh, abscess and then the, uh, the length is in the ordinate. So, uh, and you see that line is sloping upward, which indicating that at 800 uh, centimeters into the, uh, the group, you've got a really large shark that's uh, and, uh, between 230 and 270 uh, centimeters. So the smallest sharks were at the edge of the school, the largest sharks were at the center, and most of the sharks were females. So there is a female right there, and we noticed that a lot of the females were scarred. That seemed odd to me. Why are they so scarred? And what I did again, being a scientist, is I made a, a graph. And here we have a view of the lateral right, the lateral left, and this right here is the lateral left, the dorsal, the top, and the ventral, the bottom. And if you look here, let's look at the second histogram in the top. You see those black uh, bars? They're where that, <coughs> where that scar is. Uh, so these females had a lot of scars on the, 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 the left and right side and top. Also, some of them actually had them on the underside. So that made me wonder, here I'm like, one of the best movies I've ever seen is Columbo. He was an amazing detective, amazing scientist. <laughs> he could observe things and make inferences. And that's what I, this is a Columboism right here in which I'm, I'm arguing that based on the, the scarring here and the scarring there, that the females are, <clears throat> are inflicting scars. So <clears throat> I designed, well, and, uh, Jerry Clay, a, a, a master uh, builder of housings, built the first portable 
video system. It was back in the early 70s, and um, look how big it is compared to a, a camcorder that you might carry in one hand right now. Uh, and this is uh, from a, 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 a portrait that my father made of me, and I will say that my one of my graduate students, uh, uh, Cynthia Laboom, said, the guys look at the sharks, but the girls look at your thighs. I don't know, but I was really fit at that time because I was diving it, 80, diving down to 80 to 100 feet over and over and carrying this uh, uh, this this huge, heavy uh, monitor, which in the water, though, was neutrally buoyant. And here, Don and I are viewing the uh, a tape of a shark. And we uh, recorded a number of behaviors. One, a hit. So my Columboism was right. Sharks, the female sharks, were hitting the females, other females, on the dorsum or the side. And they were larger. The, the ones that did this were the larger one, larger than ones that were receiving the strikes. They also did an amazing behavior. It, what I called a corkscrew and, and being a swimmer and, and observing divers, it was a reverse flip with a full twist. And they would do this and sharks would dart away and, 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 and toward the periphery. The challenge the hammerhead shark has is that it, it's gray and it blends into the background and it, they are counter shaded. They're slightly darker on the, on the back and slightly lighter on the belly, and and so they they they're uniform in grayness, and and so how do you communicate if you're a shark and you can't be seen? Well, you do one of these behavior, you do a corkscrew, and you pulse your belly suddenly is reflecting light, pulsing it one pulse, two pulse, three pulse, and 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 the other sharks see that and respond by moving to. The, but I, as an observer, I, my attention is uh, uh, focused on that. I also observed the males, very few males, but these males, they would dash into the center and they would do a torso thrust where they would thrust the center of their body to the side once, twice. There's a clasper that's inserted into the female during reproduction. So the males, would dash into the center and pair with these vixen females, these giant dominant females. And then they would go off. Uh, now this here is the corkscrew. Now watch, see that show? And you see how light reflects? Again, sharks being counter uh, countershaded and uh, producing a flash when they do a behavior. This will show a mating very infrequent to actually see this ephemeral event. And this is at the sea mount, and, and the male is clasped with his mouth, the female, and, and asserted his clasper, and uh, off the, uh, the female goes uh, and has been inseminated. So, uh, important question was, how many sharks were in these groups? And so to find out, it's really difficult to know <coughs> because got that video camera and they're passing, sharks are passing by, passing by. How do you know you're not seeing them a second time? Well, you dive, there's a way of <coughs> determining size of populations called the Lincoln Index. And, and you use a mark and down here on the lower right, is a color-coded spaghetti streamer tag. And you see it's blue and yellow. And so we could determine that this particular shark was uh, tagged. Now, the sharks, again, we needed to free dive because they were frightened with the uh, sight of the sound and the bubbles. And here I am diving down to tag one. And there's the color-coded dart tag, and there the shark is tagged. It accelerates, but then they return to the school 
and they swim within the school. Um, I think the stress is minimal. Um, when we put transmitters on, they generally shed them over time. And I think they do the same with these marks. <clears throat> so how do you estimate population size of sharks? Well, there's a simple formula right here. <clears throat> the number <clears throat> of sharks present uh, relative to the sharks observed is equal to the tags deployed and the tags observed. So uh, in uh, the morning of, oh, this is, I think the 7th of August, uh, 1980, uh, Don and I, we tagged 21 of these sharks in maybe two hours in the morning. And uh, we came back uh, in the afternoon and we actually counted 225 of them. And of that 225, nine had tags on them. So you do the math and you get 525 sharks. That's a lot of sharks in a small area. So these sharks, but not only sharks, uh, tuna, yellowfin tuna, um, a lot of species, even billfish, marlin, and my wife who's listening, she uh, got in the water with me and of all things, we ran into a huge marlin, which was displaying to us. And I said, baby, we better, <laughs> we better back up so we don't get shish kebobbed by this uh, marlin. <clears throat> so why are the schools of hammerheads there? And, and to, you can understand that to some, somewhat by knowing that they're volcanic in origin, and they're created by the deposition of basalts from eruptions over geological time. And they often occur in chains, such as the Galapagos Islands or the Hawaiian Islands. Now, this shows where Bajo Espiritu Santo is. La Paz is there. Uh, Isla Espiritu Santo is out there. Now, imagine. This right here, that's um, 20 kilometers, 10 miles from shore. This is another 10 miles from this island. You can barely see the island. That's where we are, in the middle of nowhere. But it's a hot spot. It's New York City of hammerhead sharks. So why are pelagic or open ocean fishes present there? Now some ocean species like the basking shark or the whale shark. These are planktivorous. They feed on plankton, my, 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 microscopic animals. They're generally ocean, oceanic and nomadic, moving between front, between where uh, water comes to the surface, bringing lots of nutrients and their phytoplankton and their zooplankton. But many uh, remain at sea mounts and islands between their migrations and and why do they aggregate at this again it's a food story you have a mass of water shown here with the point is showing moving over this uh seamount and what it does is it compresses the water column and increases the density of all these good things to eat and uh i, I think probably all of you have done a hike and you've hiked up a mountain and you've gone over the the pass and 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 felt the winds that go uh by increased uh, uh at these uh windy passes in a sense a uh a shark uh, a sea mount is is a windy pass now shown here are two graduate students of mine uh salvador ex students salvador jorgensen's near uh uh at the top uh and and uh john reichert is at the bottom they're near snell's window right there where light comes through the the uh from from the surface and they did visual censuses of of different species at the seamount now if you look at the graph at the bottom here we have another graph <coughs> august and august are at the edges of the graph. And you see the black kind of squiggly line, 
that's temperature. And on the right side is what those temperatures are. So they could be really warm, almost 30 degrees. That's almost boiling, it's so hot. Uh, to the uh, winter, you get a cold, and then uh, summer again, it gets warm again. Uh, the red line right here is these summer species. Now, not only are there the predators, such as a scalloped hammerhead shark and the dolphin fish, but also the fish that they feed upon, the prey, such as the green jack and the yellow snapper. And you can see the red marks there indicating that they're there during the summer uh, and not there during the winter. But in the winter, there are also our species there, the yellow tail, the amberjack, and the red snapper. So you have, and, and you can see that in the blue lines there that uh, peak at the center of the graph. So hammerheads, but also the marlin, the sailfish, uh, the dolphin fish, uh, the green jack and the snapper, they're all there during the summer. These other species are there during the winter. Now, I, you know, I'm half biologist, half electronics technician, <coughs> a quarter electronics technician, and a quarter geophysics, a physicist, because if you wanted to understand why the sharks were there, you need to know something about the ocean. And, and so I'm going to teach you a little bit about the ocean. Uh, and a little bit about what plate tectonics, the spreading of ocean plates. If you look at the top uh, picture, you see right here uh, an oceanic spreading zone where basalt from the outer uh, core comes up and it spreads outward at three to four centimeters, only an inch a year, and it keeps spreading outward. One in one direction, let's say towards South America, towards the Andes, in the other direction towards uh, Europe. And as it spreads, eventually it subducts and it goes underneath, and that creates the Andes. <clears throat> but it also can create island trenches right here, shown to the left right here. <clears throat> now, the basalt has little magnets in it. It's called the called it's called magnetite and it's dipole magnets, little tiny little things. And as it spreads, they uh, the bas the magnetite in the basalt all align to the Earth's field, south to north, north to south, and so you have them all aligned. And then over time, the Earth's field reverses. You probably didn't know that at times north becomes south but this occurs after many thousands of years so you get what's shown on the, the picture below these lineations we call them magnetic lineations that could serve for instance birds travel all the way from the Ant from the arctic to the antarctic they could do it simply by following one of these uh, magnetic lineations, and 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 so could sharks. There's evidence that when plates rotate and these magnetic lineations intersect the shore, that's where whales strand. But we won't talk that much about that. So here is a seamount on the left, right there, uh, one of these uh, stratovolcanoes, and because they're created by volcanic eruptions. Bam, and then there'll be a long period of time, and then boom, another one. You have magnetite in part of the seamount facing north, and uh, magnetite in the other part facing the other direction. So you have an asymmetry, and you have what's called a dipole, which is shown right here a dipole. Uh, but then you have uh, volcanic eruptions that move off to their a distance. Now, I've been at the Galapagos Islands, and I've seen from uh, uh, the top of a volcano, I've seen how far they go. They can go as far as 20 kilometers, 10 miles. Right here to the uh, on the bottom right are shown these magnetic, what we call ridges and uh, valleys. That's just a topographic 
um, analogy. They're uh, a linear maxima or a minute, which is equivalent to a ridge in a sense, if you think on a map, and a minimum, which is a valley, if you think of a valley on a, on a map. So we needed to study sharks <clears throat> and we used uh, remote sensing. I mean, you can, one of the challenges studying a mobile species like a shark is that they move out of your view. On land, <clears throat> if you're on a hill, you can see five miles away under the ocean in the best, you could, best conditions. You can see 10 meters, 30 feet. And so how do you study a mobile animal uh, in the ocean, such as a shark? And we put these coded tags shown right here in this ob oblong right here. And they, they go a period of time and they go, bop, 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 bop. And uh, then they are signing for a period of time and they go, bop, 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 bop. And there's a receiver that we put out shown right here um, that with that times the intervals between those pulses and determines an ID for it. And periodically we retrieve it. Now here is the great James Ketchum, one of my students, ex-students, tagging a whale shark and tagging a hammerhead shark. I've been lucky enough to be graced by wonderful uh, young scientists that worked with me. And uh, here is a, uh, a picture kind of showing what this will do, this technology would do. We catch a fish shown here, put a, a tag inside it, Right here, it's uh, emitting a sound. You put a receiver on one side of the seamount and you put a receiver on the other side and you have a fish on either side detected by this receiver. Then you take the receiver out and you get a, a time graph. And you're gonna see this over and over in my graph. Think of this as a clock. At the top is midnight, at the bottom is noon, uh, 6 a.m. in the morning, 6 p.m. at night, and you see daytime yellow, nighttime blue, and these are detections of a fish that are there both during day and night. Now, with the sharks at the seamount, shown right here, uh, at Spiritus Santo Seamount, here on the right, we have something really interesting. This is a topographic uh, contour map of the sea mounted two ridges one right here i'm showing uh 18 meters another here uh 18 meters and we're putting a monitor right here it's this is the range of the monitor monitor one that's the range on the, the south side of monitor two and on the upper right hand the corner now not just two fish but 18 hammerhead sharks. You see the dark on the top, uh, that's nighttime. On the bottom, it's daytime. You'll see a time when we ha didn't have the, the receiver in, in the water. Now, if you look at these little chicks right there, the ticks, notice how they line up during the day. Right there, I'm showing two of them lining up, and then they disappear at the same time during the day. They're not received. Then they're received during the day. They're in a school and they're moving into the, uh, the range of the, then they're moving out. <clears throat> if you look at from four to 6 a.m., you can see that they arrive at different times. But once they get there at, let's say, 534, they start, they're in the, the, the school. So they're moving, they're detected at the same time, then they're detected at a different time. So in and out and in and out of the range of the receiver, they, they come during the day. And then as the day progresses, and again, the schools become more diffuse and the sharks are now moving a little bit away and moving a little bit away. And it's very hard to tag them at that time because they avoid you. And then as it gets really dark, now you're almost in darkness and you're diving, it's kind of scary. And they are moving really fast. Like, I'm hurry, 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 hurry. <laughs> and then, they leave and they leave one by one. You can see by the end of these black uh, uh, concentric circles that they're leaving as and so on. Now look at the uh, circular graph from monitor two. There are almost no detections. Isn't that amazing? It's only, this is, oh, okay. You have, if I show you right here, zero, a hundred meters. <coughs> 
The center of the two monitors are only 200 meters apart, yet they only go in the north towards the north. Uh, they're only detected on the north uh, west side of the seamount, not on the north east side of the seamount. Or northeast side of the seamount, not on the northwest side. I got to get that right. Okay, so here we go. Uh, another way of studying sharks is to track them by boat. And it's a lot of work. And, uh, you know, Pat was with me when we tracked one shark, remember that? For 11 days following, we had a team of people tracking during the day and a team of people tracking at nighttime. And you, the transmitter attached to the side of the boat <clears throat> is a, uh, a movable bracket that will allow you to drop a hydrophone, which is a, a receiver that receives the sound from the transmitter. And you, like shown here, Buck Buck Buckhorn is uh, shown with uh, the hydrophone. You rotate it back and forth and you hear the direction where the signal's strongest. Bing, 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 bing. And you tell your operator the boat, go in that direction. And the, the 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 operator drives the boat in that direction. Now, and and Buck turns down the gain and listens again and rotates it. Bing 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 bing. Ah, in that direction. And uh, motor the boat in that direction. And 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 the, and the helmsman does that. She turns down the gain the gain and puts the, the hydrophone, rotates it, bing, 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 bing. It's the same intensity in all directions. The boat is over the shark. And so you can get the GPS coordinates and you can drop a, a device and get water temperature, salinity, and draw, uh, dissolve down to it. It is really hard to follow a shark that's moving away from the sea mount. It's, it's easier here. This shows a track of a shark 20 kilometers away. It's not hard to follow it going away from the SEMA because the winds have not started to blow and you don't have waves and strong waves. But following it back is really difficult because you're hitting waves. When in, and my wife, Pat, she had the late night uh, watch. And they lost the shark twice. And uh, they told me, your wife is in charge. Okay, to kind of, so that I didn't get mad at her. I wouldn't get mad at her. You know, how can you get mad at my, my wife? <laughs> and, but it's true, it's very difficult to follow because the shark was underwater. The boat was on the surface of the water and the waves there. So now you got the circles again, but these not time. This is a compass with 360 degrees north, 180 degrees south. And I want you to, to see that this shark moves out. And it now at the end of its track, it's 20 kilometers, 10 miles away from the seamount. Now we have the vessel, the mother vessel halfway there. It's determining our position based on a radio, radar bearing and range. and. Uh, 20 kilometers or 10 miles, it's dark, it's moonless. All we can see in the great distance is the light of the boat. And the shark turns around, it's going back, and it's gonna go underneath the boat. How could it do that? Now I want you to see, you notice how when it comes back, it comes back along the same track as it went out. How did it do that? Because you know the the current the the tide was coming in when we were tracking it out. It was coming from uh, east to west, but now after twenty two hundred hours, it's going from west to east. The track should be in part. It must be following something fixed to see the sea floor or maybe even the magnetic field. Now on these uh, these uh, these compass. Uh, plots are shown 10 successive directions. Look at how directional. Now, there's a, uh, a statistic. It's called 
the Raleigh uh, uh, index. One is if the an, uh, an animal is going in a perfectly straight line. Uh, zero if the the directions are uniform in all directions. So this shark was moving in an extraordinary directional way. And uh, let's see here. Oops. So I said that they are moving out and back along the same path. And to me, that seemed amazing. Uh, how do they do that? They must have some kind of reference. And so I became a geophysicist. I learned a lot about magnetic fields. I bought books. I, I, I took a class from brilliant geophysicists at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I would hang out with those guys uh, and learn more about magnetic fields. And we took the boat, we, we towed a magnetometer that measures magnetic field around it once, twice, three times, four times, all the way out, one every nautical mile distance from the, to 10 uh, nautical miles, the distance that the sharks went. On the right are shown the records both of the magnetometer and a simulation. Because these armchair biologists would always say, well, it's why the sharks are doing this randomly. How can they do that randomly? How can they go 20 kilometers away, you know, 20 kilometers away and come back swimming randomly? I don't think so. But anyway, I had to show that. Uh, and what you can see here is with these arrows is the red ones indicate that the shark is moving along outward along a ridge. The seamount exists on the edge of a magnetic lineation. And then there are these lava flows that 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 uh, flowed um, <clears throat> uh, westerly and create these magnetic uh, ridges and valleys. And on the map, the lineation is labeled as number one, uh, and it's a, it's a ridge. And then uh, halfway back, from that is, is a uh, a valley, and the shark moves out along the ridge shown here, one and one, and then it comes back along that valley shown here is two and two, and and so they they use these uh, magnetic ridges and valleys. I I hypothesize, but there's more and more uh, data indicating that they do. And here we have a, a simulation showing the shark moving along a, a, a magnetic uh, ridge extending away from the seamount, turning around and coming back. Think of these in a sense as roads radiating from. But these sharks, they're not in a car, a fancy car like you, and they're not driving along uh, an asphalt drive with with a yellow line that they follow or a, a dotted line they stay on the inside or a dashed line they stay on the inside uh, within a lane they they don't have this how do they do it um they don't have these these lines but they move as you might move uh, along a highway between two cities so i think one of the reasons I studied the hammerhead is it's so unique. I thought that if I studied an animal with an adaptation that was like really different than all other animals, many other animals, I might learn something really important. And and so if you look at on the left here, there's the hammerhead shark and, and below it is showing a geomagnetic gradient. Uh, and you see that Below the hammerhead shark is a garden variety reef shark. Its ampullary organs are shown for two of them. They, they bi they're they bifurcate. You have them coming out in both directions. And the animal can compare the, the output from one side to the output from the other side. 
And let's say if the, the gradient is only five kilometer, uh, five uh, units, uh, it, the, uh, the garden variety shark can detect it. But let's say it's, it's, uh, there's a difference in eight. Uh, because the, the hammerhead shark is wider, it can, can detect a, uh, a smaller gradient than the, the, uh, than the garden variety shark. And so to explain this, uh, right here in the center, I show that here's a cable. We've studied cables that create electromagnetic fields. What the uh, animal is perceiving is a change in the gradient. That is, uh, at the left here, uh, there's no gradient, but then there's a, a gradient starting. Here, there's no gradient and there's a gradient starting. And so what I, I have used, I, I resorted to going to the library at Davis and pulling out a series of maps. USGS maps, and I pulled out a map that showed the trail that the immigrants used to to go to to San Diego, and and if, if you look at this map right here, at the bottom of the map, the Sierra Nevada uh, mountains, they abruptly start. Here I hit myself on my abruptly get higher and the desert is uh, on one side the steep slope of the mountain on the other side so a emigrant or a uh, a, a person a, a wagon train could go along the base of the sierras from reno to to southern california just by going along the base of that of the mountains and very simply but how do you cross well there's a, a ravine and these are created by rivers very often and there you can cross contours of elevation but on either side of that ravine is a steep steep uh wall and so that's a way of going up the ascending canyon you get to the top and then you go to a descending canyon. so this uh, explains a very simple way of traveling. I call it geomagnetic topotaxis. Geomagnetic, uh, magnetic, topo, uh, a map, taxis, an attraction to a feature on that map. So these uh, these detectors, ampullae of Lorenzini, they're electroreceptors, uh, they occur on either side of the head and i'm going to show you you can see them right there as the, right there the dark dark uh, 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 uh is it, and and not only are they used could they use, be used in in navigation they're also used to detect prey because they can detect wrasses and other species that bury themselves under under the the, the ground at nighttime or, or even a, a parrot fish that creates a mucilaginous cocoon. The men, uh, the the Maoris can't using smell can't get them, but the uh, the sharks do. It's an incredible sense for an animal to have. So I want to show now, uh, and I'm almost finished with my talk, a a video that gives you experimental evidence of why they do detect. Now, the field that's created here is a very strong field. Uh, the field that there's evidence now that they can detect much weaker fields, papers that are done on birds. Uh, and this work was done by uh, Carl Mayer, Nick Holland, uh, Ken, Ken Holland, and Yanis Papamazio, a good colleague of, of mine, of all of them I know well. It was published in the Royal Society Interface. So, Kawabunga, you're going to hear that. Sharks the, used in magnetoreception studies are housed in a seven meter diameter tank. The tank is surrounded by a coil consisting of 100 turns of 18 gauge copper wire. 
power to the coil is provided by a 13.8 volt, 1.5 amp power supply. Okay, go ahead. Applying power to the coil alters the magnetic field within the tank. And off. To test the hypothesis that sharks can detect magnetic fields, the animals are first conditioned to feed over a PVC quadrat in the presence of the altered magnetic field. Five, four, three, two, one, magnet on. The sharks are subsequently presented only with the altered magnetic field. Shark Magnet Trials, March 26, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, Magnet Off. They respond by converging on the quadrat, even though no food is present. This experiment demonstrates that these sharks can detect magnetic fields. Sharks used in magnet. So um, every magnetic field also has an uh, a electric field, and 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 so the the hammerhead sharks have been shown to have ampular of Lorenzini, and and they are they detect uh, very weak uh, geomagnetic fields or, or dipoles that are created by by prey. Um, but there are many other species that also show this sense, and so. We all wonder whether there's an a, a, a unknown sense. This is one of the mysteries of animal biology that's yet to be uh, solved. This sense, and, and it may have to do, it may be intracellular and have to do with magnetic material, which exists within cells and their aligning and a, a, a very different sense than these other senses such as uh, uh, the ampler Lorenzini is not that different than uh, the lateral line sound detection or, or another sense. So anyway, I wanna show you one last view of the school of sharks, um, which are actually magnificent and, uh, and learning about why they form these schools and why they're at Seamount has, has been a, a wonderful a puzzle to, to try to decode. And thank you so much for listening to my talk. And as an aside, I will I, I'm, I must be self-serving and show, show some books that I've written. Uh, this particular book, Dr. Hammerhead Swims with Sharks, um, it's Science and understandable to the lay person with great shark pictures. Each chapter answers a question. One of the chapters is, um, are why are are white sharks human eaters or seal eaters? In reality, they're not human eaters. They're seal eaters. They, they strike humans because they they see an object at the surface and and, and they spit them out because they don't have the fat that a seal has. Um, Biology of Sharks and Rays, published by the University of Chicago. It's a, a textbook, and it has everything you would want to know about the taxonomy, morphology, behavior, ecology, physiological, physiology, and the evolution of chondrichthyes and fishes. A Secret Life of Sharks by uh, Cyrus. This is a personal account of diving with hammerhead sharks. And in fact, in it, I, I describe at one point when we found that we played back a killer whale sound to silky sharks. Hey, first time they heard it, it leaped out of the water, they're so frightened. So I took a wetsuit and I painted it like a killer whale with a and, and with a uh, H pattern on the belly and in an oval pattern during the, on on the head and 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 fashioned 
a fin out of wood. I was had a sailboat, so I was doing a lot of carpentry and had fins that I would purpose in the water. And uh, I found that I, I put it on and the sharks, um, they, uh, they were, they were frightened and, 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 uh, and then I took it off. They weren't, and then I put it back on this time. In, in both cases, they showed an agonistic display where they pull their fins, they arch their backs. And, and, and the, sec the second time they actually tried to bite me, I had a billy that I could fend them off, fend them off with shark, closest I've ever been a, to being attacked by a shark. Uh, and the final book is, it's a compendium on great white sharks, the biology of uh, Kakara and Kakaris. Anything you wanna know about uh, sharks, it's available from Amazon, as is a Secret Life of Shark, as is um, Biology of Sharks. But uh, if you're interested in sharks and you want a book that has a little bit of science, like my talk, but then a lot about sharks, Dr. Hammerhead Swimsuit so is just what you need. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pete, uh, for that. Uh, educational presentation. It's fascinating stuff, the behavior of sharks, how they navigate, how they interact amongst each other, but also how uh, they respond to human uh, intervention or encounters as well. You know, so we're, we're at the hour, so we, we, I don't know if we have any questions, uh, but, um, you know, what is uh, really fascinating and, um, you know, the purpose of uh, the existence of organizations like Fins Attached is obviously for conservation. So you can't have the conservation without the science to back up your conservation message. So it's it's really critical the work that you've done, continue to do, and how we can leverage that data of uh, shark movements, uh, habitat use, et cetera, is the kind of information that can ultimately be used to uh, create or change international policy because I'm all, I'm all about changing international policy uh, to for the conservation of sharks. So thank you everyone for attending. I see uh, Pete's already turned his camera off. So thank you. Well, I um, can, uh, my, camera, my camera's on, so I can't see myself.